tutoriales. The idea of this tutorial is that we're going to start introducing different topics and we'll stop as we go along to receive questions from the participants. So if, and if should you have any questions, please ask your questions in the Q&A slot and we will then answer these when we make pauses. Nicolas and Erika, please feel free to stop me if you wish to make any comments, if you wish to add anything on my presentation. The idea is to have a tutorial which can serve to exchange knowledge. So if you have any comments, please feel free to do so. So let us start. The idea is to start speaking about the internet interconnection. I will describe how traffic is carried out. We normally have what we call content providers. There is content that we wish to have access to, and we have networks that are focused on providing connection to the users. These are the eyeball networks. Internet is an interconnection of autonomous systems of different organizations. Here we see ISPs that do transit providing and also content providers who also have transit providers and are all interconnected through the autonomous system. So what happens when a content provider is successful and has a lot of traffic? Well, they will have to expand their capacity. The traffic along their links will grow, so they have to expand their connection. Now, as that traffic starts to grow and users consume more, the providers, the access ISPs, will have to expand their links with the transit providers. And eventually, this might lead to the fact that the transit providers in turn expand their own links. So the growth of a content provider leads eventually to the expansion of the entire chain. So when we detect this, the convenient thing to do is the following. Instead of increasing all these links in the middle, is to have a direct connection to the access ISPs. In other words, to have the content closer to the users. That is the way, to a certain extent, this is working for content networks and for the traffic exchange points. Now, we're going to see now how we go about interconnection. There are two basic modalities. One is peering, which is direct interconnection between two autonomous systems whereby the border routers of the organizations connect with one another and we have the ISPs of the two routers. So ISP A or organization A announces all, all its networks to organization B and organization B does the announcements to organization A. In that way, we can obtain traffic from the other and reach the city, the site. Now, this direct interconnection can be complex. Imagine if we have many autonomous systems and each autonomous system has to connect with others, then that interconnection might not scale well. We would have to connect with all those with whom we have interconnection. So then, the, we also have the public interconnection. Public interconnection consists in having sites where the operators interconnect with one another. These can be data centers. There are big data centers where the different operators reach if they have the possibility of interconnecting, or also what we call an IXP, a traffic internet 
interconnection point. So we speak about different types of connections. So we need to look at some basic concepts. The first is transit, IP transit. This is traffic transmission through a network. And normally this is associated to a cost. So an organization allows me to use their network to reach a given site. And that traffic is normally IP traffic. And in that way, I can use that network to reach another site. We normally speak about this concept as IP traffic. But it could also be traffic towards an IXP or some other organization. We say that normally this is associated to a cost because it's not two symmetrical organizations but one of these is the one that provides traffic to the other. We speak about peering when these are organizations that interconnect with one another in order to receive traffic from the other. Each announces the other with route information contained in that organization. So two organizations that for some reason wish to exchange traffic with one another. They have a high traffic volume, so they decide to interconnect directly. And so can establish a link which is called peering. And then there's an additional definition that I have here, which is default zone. These are the autonomous systems that do not require a default route to reach any destination in the internet. These are normally the large operators which are present globally. In this slide, what I wanted to show you are two terms that seem to be the same. And these are two different things, transit and transport. As we said, transit is a layer three service in IP. This is IP traffic that can be BGP or not. This is normally used in BGP. This occurs in layer three. What are the features? If you think about an internet connection, the cost is based on the capacity, on the traffic megabits that you receive. And the cost is based on the megabits per second. This is normally used to send traffic to several sites. When you speak about IP traffic, then you connect to the entire internet. And this traffic largely depends on who provides the service as an upstream provider which will then guide the traffic to another place. And when we speak about transport, this is normally referred to layer two services, Metro Ethernet, SDH services. This is normally on layer two. And the cost is quite different compared to the traffic cost. In this case, we have a fixed capacity for 10 gigas or one gigabits per second. And this is regardless of the amount of traffic that goes through that link. This link, this transport link, will provide a given capacity. For example, 10 gigs. The more I use it, the better. I'm going to pay a fixed amount. So if I am underusing it, it's expensive if I use it better and closer to the hired capacity, then I will be more efficient in my use of that link. Normally, transport allows, to, allows us to connect two sites with one another, for example, in the case of peering. And the traffic is limited to those organizations that establish this transport. So it's a link between the two organizations that interconnect with one another. Let us now speak about the traffic exchange points. An IXP is 
a site where the network operators interconnect. IXPs have other names. In the region, they receive other names, PIT, PTT, Chile, Peru use PIT. PTT is the concept in Brazil, Ponto de Troca de Tráfico, NAP, in FAST, in Cabase, in Argentina. This is the name they gave to it. But you will see different acronyms, but all these are IXPs. Now, basically, this is shared infrastructure for exchanging traffic at that point. Different organizations connect with one another, ISPs, content providers, but also universities and other sites that have content such as the banks and media. And this is something that is quite interesting because what we wish to have in an IXP is precisely to have the largest number of organizations that provide content. So if you have not just the network operators, the, the IXPs, but other operators that have contents, uh, including universities, for instance, well, that strengthens the traffic that uh, is exchanged through um, that. Uh, and uh, Regularly, there are several layers that are get interconnected uh, that uh, is different from the private peering. And here there's something interesting to it to mention that an IXP is different from an access uh, network or the transit or carriot network. The function of uh, the role of IXP is to interconnect networks. It won't the, an IXP won't give me access to other sites. It's not. Uh, uh, a provider of access to users, nor will it give me uh, uh, transit to the internet. The IXP enables uh, um, uh, to interconnect networks that are separate organizations. They are independent autonomous systems. But the most important thing is that, and that's what uh, I'd like to, to uh, highlight that an, an IXP is a site that interconnects different organizations. And it's not that the IXP provides uh, internet services. What are the advantages of IXPs? Well, it has to do with the stability, the stability and resilience that they provide where they exist. First of all, the local uh, traffic gets uh, routed locally, so it gives you a better control on uh, the local traffic. There are many autonomous systems. Uh, the length of uh, the path is uh, smaller, so the traffic doesn't have to go through so many sites, so you keep a better an eye on them. And uh, the uh, uh, latency uh, for the different apps is reduced, and that's important. For instance, financial apps or uh, games apps. We can also say that we have the possibility of reducing costs, either through CDNs uh, or because we hire local traffic and we are not using all the traffic, all the link for the internet. So in that uh, sense, it reduces costs. If we have local costs lower than transit costs, then we, we reduce the cost. This is an issue that we will comment later. Por otro lado, eh, acotamos el tráfico a una región, país o zona y no es visto de otra región. On the other hand, the traffic belongs to a region uh, locally, so it is not seen by other regions. It's going to the traffic is limited to a certain region. That may have a security advantages as it doesn't go through other organizations or other countries. We're going to have a better control on the traffic. The IXPs typically are good sites to introduce new technologies such as IPv6, uh, RPKI, and DACNIC, we are interested in that. It allows us to introduce RPKI and, and IPv6, etc. And 
A last thing that is worth pointing out of the IXPs is the sense of community they create that enables you to share the problems and the strategies among the operators. They've already mentioned throughout the event that very often the operators are seen only as competitors, but to the extent that the perception uh, seen from far away is as, as sometimes they see each other as they have, they share problems, so they end up sharing. In most IXPs, the most evolved IXPs, there are technical teams that share problems that have a negative impact on all of them. For instance, if there are any routing incidents, technical problems, etc., it's very common for the operators to exchange information and they may benefit of the information provided by others. As we said earlier, uh, when you compare cost of transit and uh, carrying an, uh, an IXP, uh, comparing the cost of uh, transit and other initiative, it's different here. We compare transit and an IXP. In the case of transit, it's based on the usage. The more bandwidth I use, then the more uh, the uh, it will fall with the capacity. It's not linear, but it, it drops a bit, but it increases as I use uh, more bandwidth. Um, in the case of an IXP, the cost that you have to consider is, first of all, carrying it to the site of the I, uh, IXP, that is uh, a flat fee, then the co-location, uh, the routers that we have to put, if we have to install a router, usually the data centers, charge for connection and usually the IXP charges uh, a certain amount to pay for the expenditures. Usually that is divided among the members. Usually these are uh, flat fees. So usually the costs that we have to connect to an IXP are uh, flat fees overhead. This is Dr. Peering uh, that analyzed the cost of transit uh, versus peering. Um, I recommend you to see this. There is an issue that we can say that is the, a break point after which if I use more capacity, the cost per mega will be more effective. So this horizontal line would be the cost of transit that is always the same. While in the case of peering, as we said, that it, the broader, uh, the more bandwidth I use, the more efficient it will be because I use a fixed uh, um, amount so i will use this more efficiently if if i transmit more and if i trans uh, if i transmit less the mega each mega will be more expensive so um i may be if i'm not using it enough it may not be worth it if i have a lot of capacity uh, i will make uh, I, I, I will take better advantage. This is something that you need to analyze when you decide whether to do a peering or an IXP. So in this tutorial, we are seeing it a bit uh, shallowly. We tend to organize longer tutorials. Each of these things that I mentioned uh, should be described more in length, but this is just an introduction to the internet interconnection um, issues. And I wanted to show the at least the most important things. What is an IXP like? In the most basic 
uh, scheme is a switch and a router that get interconnected to the switch. But this uh, is not very good. It's, it can't be scaled up if we only have the switch. And we need to, and in order to exchange traffic with the other organizations, I need uh, to use the link of ISP. I should have a, a mesh like this with each of the autonomous systems uh, with uh, IXP connections with all the rest. And it, that, that doesn't scale up well because each new uh, incomer, then you have to connect with each and one, uh, each and all of them. So it uh, becomes uh, rather cumbersome. So what IXPs typically use is root servers. The use of root servers uh, permits uh, the autonomous systems to establish uh, IXP uh, sessions with uh, a router or a server that speaks IXP, but only participates of the routing information and doesn't forward the traffic. So the different autonomous systems will establish BGP connections with one or two uh, um, uh, machines, but basically with this, while the traffic will, will go through the switch, but it won't reach the router. It will be exchanged in the switch. So this machine doesn't need to be very complex. It will simply manage the logic of the routing. That is why the route servers are typically uh, implement uh, BGP uh, software. What, so what is a route server? Usually it's a Unix server that runs a routing software. We are going to see some open source solutions for that. Basically what it does is to activate the functionality of BGP and it exchanges routing information with the routers of service providers in an IXP based on policies. I repeat, it doesn't send packets. It only manages the routing uh, rational. The forwarding is done in the switch and it avoids a huge number of sessions, uh, BGP sessions. The good thing about root servers is that you can implement filtering um, actions, fil uh, filtering of uh, autonomous systems and Bogan prefixes, the autonomous, uh, the Bogan autonomous systems and prefixes are not assigned to the internet. So they shouldn't be announced by BGP. You can infil the implement filters per client. That's easier so that not all the operators have to um, implement the filters. And you can apply some security measures, for instance, the route leaks. If a table, a complete table of the root server is filtered, then the root server can throw it away. And that's good, not just for the IXP members, but even for those that are not in the IXP or the who do appearing uh, with a root, root server because those routes are not awarded. And also the possibility of uh, implementing uh, filters through RPKI or IRR or who is, they can be implemented in a route server much more uh, easier manner. So we uh, there there are a couple of software to implement this. One is a root server and IXP. The other is IXP manager. The former is a Python tool that generates configurations for Bird or OpenBGPD. It uh, 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 it supports IRR, RPKI, who is uh, a DB peering to obtain the S sets and it's easy to integrate with other systems. The IXP manager is a bit more complex. It, uh, um, for an, uh, not only does it include the root server and the configurations uh, for BIRD, but it includes another software that uh, allows you to manage um, IXP and uh, uh, produce more rep reports. Maybe for IXPs that are new and that don't have their systems implemented, 
the uh, IXP manager may be more convenient, while the others that only want to implement a root server can use a root server that uh, is uh, easy to use. So what you have then is that the root server implements the policies and the autonomous systems would raise sessions with the route server. In many IXPs, there are two types of agreements, multilateral and bilateral. The multilateral one does sessions with the BGP and the route server. In other words, all the autonomous systems do the BGP sessions with the route servers. In the case of the bilateral case, the organizations can have BGP sessions with other organizations without the need of going through the route server. They're going to exchange traffic with BGP sessions with one another. And each IXP has its own standards. There's not just one way of working. Some have the two types of agreements, some have bilateral, others have multilateral, which allow bilateral agreements or not. Now, the important thing is to be aware that the two options exist, namely the bilateral agreement where each provider establishes the relation it requires with other providers in the IXP. In other words, they establish VGP uh, this, um, the sessions with the routers, the border routers of other providers. And in the multilateral agreements, each provider establishes sessions with the concentrator and the border routers of the ISPs have an IXP as a neighbor. Here we have several references, the campus courses of LACNIC, the route servers. And if you wish to check these, I leave them on the screen. I will stop here now to see if we have any questions so far. Thank you, Guillermo, great presentation. I'm Carlos once again, and I'm your secretary at the checkpoint. Question from Serpro is asking, which are the limitations of using an IXP? Well, the limitation of using an IXP. Well, in fact, the IXPs Well, each operator, in fact, will obtain an, from the IXP whatever is more convenient for them. Normally, medium-sized and small operators will connect to an IXP. As I was saying, the IXP allows connecting from one to many, for example, multilateral connections. With one single connection, we can reach out to different operators. Now, in the case of larger operators, this could be of interest for several reasons. But two big operators between one another will have to do direct peering in order to exchange a larger bandwidth and so as not to use the same platform as the rest is using so they might have some kind of private agreement with one another now this can be on in the same site where the ixp is but maybe not using the central switches and so on we have quite a number of questions hugo rivera is asking the following IXPs, are they promoted on a private initiative by the ISPs or for non-profit organizations? Can you implement IXPs with different organizations at geographical level? For example, in the north, one ISP, in the center, a civil society organization, in the south, a university, do they need to be coordinated or can they work independently? I would answer yes to all these questions. Yes. Private initiative, yes. Well, yes to all the questions. It could be private, this could be from 
company, it could be a nonprofit organization. Very often in the region, the majority are nonprofit organizations. We have also yeah. commercial IXPs, or to a certain extent, call the, these as I say, we have some benefits, other, other types of organizations. And also, yes, we have countries such as Brazil or Argentina, where they have, I don't know, have lots of more than 20 IXPs in different regions. I would say about more than 30. Yes, in the case of Argentina, I think of Cabase, in the case of Brazil, I can think of PTT Metro. These are two traffic exchange points which are distributed throughout the territory. You don't have to connect to all of these because these traffic exchange points, as the case of PTT Metro and Cabase, they are connected with one another. So if you can connect to one, in the majority of cases, you can also have traffic from others and IXPs that are connected in other geographical regions. So they might be concentrated, like Ijema was saying, on one single site or also distributed and interconnected internally with one another in order to have one larger IXP. Arturo is asking, are there interconnection policies for IXPs in different of different countries interconnection of ixps from different countries is not so simple in that case well let me see uh, let's take a step back normally ixps respond to a need of the operators of a given zone who see that it is convenient for them for one reason or another, sometimes economic reasons, but these can also be technical reasons. And this is for the purpose of can, getting connected. And instead of doing peering or the other options I mentioned, they could then exchange traffic locally. Now, that kind of convenience is not so clear at international level, and it's also not so easy because the traffic exchange points for international traffic would be competing with the same operators that provide international traffic. So sometimes it's not so simple. I know that there are some initiatives in the region to have IXPs between countries, but I'm not aware that any are functioning at all. Carlos Altamirano is asking, who is in charge of the IXP security? If you have a DOS, who is in charge of that? Who's responsible for this? The IXPs normally have a technical commission and each IXP has, can organize the way they wish. But in general, we have a technical committee made up of experts from each member. The members are the operators. Once again, operators in the wider sense of the word, these can be university networks or government networks and ISPs, of course, and content providers. So normally, each has a technical expert in this committee. And what they do is to set up a technical committee. Now, in turn, many of the IXPs have people who manage these teams. The technical committee makes general decisions, but then someone has to implement these. If you're going to have a route server and then configure it, someone has to do the configuration or a DNS or a server or some new service, there has to be someone who will do that job. So there are different solutions. One solution is one of the operators that is connected provides a technical service, and then they have some advantage for doing so, or you, they might hire someone to do that job through outsourcing, for example. Now, if you wish, we can stop here with the questions. Yes, because we will run out of time otherwise. 
we can we can save the questions for later on I would like to speak now about routing security so that we can keep on track and then give the floor to the other speakers. Otherwise, I will do like Nico does and not allow anyone else to speak. Okay, routing security. What are we speaking of? What incidents do we wish to prevent when we speak about routing security? One of these the most frequent one is route hijacking. This was already mentioned in the event, route hijacking. In this case, you have a client that wishes to reach a network and that client is connected to the autonomous system. The autonomous system, for example, they were to reach this network 2001-DB8-FF0020, which is over here, and this client is connected here. So this router will find this route 2001-DB8-FF0-40 and sends this to ASN65502. They have this route, which is this one, and sends this to this one here. Now, what happens when a third party comes in that publishes a route for the same prefix, but does this with a more specific prefix? So this prefix, this publication, if you're not cautious, will go through and 65509 will send it to 501. And when 501 has this route and the client reaches to reach 2001-DB8-FF00-20, they will prefer this one, which is more specific. So traffic will go along this path, and this is route hijack. There is a detour when we speak about route hijacking. This is the action of announcing unauthorized prefixes, which can be intentional or as the result of an error in the interconnection. The other case we have is that of route leaks. These are prefixes that are announced through links that should not announce these. We have two typical cases. These are prefixes that were learned from the provider that shouldn't be announced to another peer or to another provider. In other words, if I have a complete routing table of my transfix provider, I don't have to announce this to my peers or to other providers. And the same happens with the prefix is learned from a peer. These shouldn't be announced to other peers, nor to the provider. These prefixes should only be announced to the clients. In this case here, 65536 announces its blog with the slash 40 upwards to the traffic provider and then to a peer. And this one does the same thing. It announces its prefix to the transit pressure provider and then to another peer. Now, what should not occur is that this one allows the prefix to 2001db8.10 slash 40 that receives it from 65536. This should not be allowed to go to 65511. Otherwise, this is what we call a leak. This link could then, they could then start to use to reach this autonomous system instead of going through here. In this case, it would not use it because this is a shorter path. But if this leak would go to another autonomous system, it could go along this path. And even worse, if this leak were more specific than the previous one, it would also go along this path. So we have to be careful with those two types of problems. Now, how do we check whether the information received through BGP is the correct information? BGP does not have mechanisms to verify this. So what we need is to check the BGP announcements 
with external sources. So if we, as we don't have anything in BGP that allows me to determine whether an announcement is correct or not, we have to do external databases. And there are two. One is the IRR, Internet Routing Registry, and the other is RPKI, the Resource Public Key Infrastructure. The IRRs, well, this morning we heard about this, this morning Gerardo told us about this, but these are databases where the operators register their routing policies. And there are a large number of IRRs, LACNIC now has one, and the important thing is the following. Um, they use uh, those IRRs uh, to generate filters automatically. There are tools that uh, allow you to configure the routers automatically. One of them is BGPQ3 slash BGPQ4. This is an example of an internet uh, routing registry. Here, for instance, you send a query through the autonomous uh, the, the container of uh, Antel, the autonomous system of Antel, and notice that here you have the information is the route objects. The main thing of this object is a prefix and an autonomous system, an association between prefix and autonomous system. This case is the same. And then the rest of the fields have uh, useful information but uh, for the purpose of configuration, this is what you need, uh, the mapping between the prefix and uh, the autonomous system of origin. So this is what Nico Antoniello, uh, there you see uh, who changed it, Nico Antoniello. And uh, so how do you use this information? I'm going to show you a transit example. You can all read it later. In this case, Let's assume that the autonomous system 65502 wants to give transit to these three autonomous systems and will announce that to ASN 65501. On the one hand, uh, 65502 must make sure that they announce these networks and filter, etc. But let's see it from the other side. 65501 could be either a peer, an IXP, or a transit uh, link, but for some reason, this one will receive not just the networks of 65502, but the ones that are behind it. In this case, three autonomous systems. How does uh, a, uh, 65501 know what's behind? There's no way. If I have no information, I can't put any filters here. I have to accept everything that 502 sends me. What can you do? Not much. 65502 needs to help him. How can he help him? Well, with a special registry in the IRR that is called ASSET, specifying the autonomous systems he's going to give transit to. So uh, 65502 creates an ASSET with this name at the beginning, that is its own autonomous system, and then an arbitrary name. In this case, I put AS transito to, to show that it's transit, but it could say just any any name, it's immaterial. And so 65502 needs to somehow inform 65501 that this is the AS that he has to look at. And the AS set lists the members. So here it will say, well, the transit uh, autonomous systems are 509, 510, and 511. Simply the members that are the autonomous systems. With this, this one has information. So it can receive the, the prefixes of 65502 and the prefixes of the autonomous systems that 502 gives transit to. It's going to read that. And for each of these autonomous systems, it will get the list of prefixes available. So how can he do it? They, they can uh, uh, consult in who is one by one, and they take uh, the prefixes, they analyze in who is, that's one way. The other way is to use BGPQ3 or BGPQ4. And with these consults here directly, you specify the AS set that you want to consult. You give the list 
the prefix list that you will create. And in this case, you can say, well, you can consult IR. And in this case, it uh, takes a list of IPv4 and with IPv6, it does the same. It uh, draws the list of IPv6. Uh, uh, and notice that it creates the access list clients AS65502, and it creates an access list as you can use it to apply it directly to the router. So this is a very simple thing. It's if 65502 created the AES set, then you'll be able to consult the AES set and and then you can permit the BGP to get autonomous systems. Here you have references, IRR of LACNIC, uh, and then you have uh, IRR uh, DV4, that will show you how to consult it directly. And here there's general documentation of MILACNIC and IRR and RPKI. Well, it's not available yet. I think that we don't have too much time left. So let me move forward with RPKI. Perfect, adelante. Bueno, como decía, la, la, la otra alternativa que al, dijimos, the other ¿no? alternative is, well, we said that we needed to have an external uh, data source because uh, we didn't have that source of information. So if it's not an IRR, then the other alternative is RPKI. RPKI, in practice, we'll see that it's the same. The different thing about our RPKI is that it's much more solid or sound. Uh, the information that it has is, uh, is uh, mm, much more comprehensive. It defines an infrastructure of a public key that is specialized to be applied in the routing. So when LACNIC uh, gives resources to the ISPs or to end users, the organizations that they give resources to, they will give them a digital certificate for those resources. These digital certificates are similar to those known today for the websites, but in this case, they have extensions to represent IPv4, IPv6, and ASN resources. So the holder of a digital certificate will have evidence of being the owner of those resources. If you have only the owner of the digital certificate, we'll have a private uh, signature and we'll be able to sign objects involving those resources. That is basically the key of RPKI. RPKI makes it possible to generate ROAs that are uh, um, that associate the autonomous system of origin, uh, but they are signed digitally. So the organizations may define the autonomous system associated to prefixes, but can sign it with the private key with the, of the certificate that LACNIC provided them. All this information is copied into a repository that it can be accessed publicly. And it also has a mechanism of validation of prefixes. If you look at the IRR, you have methods for using it, but that is not specified anywhere. There are different methods for using the IRR, but each uses it as uh, they like. In this case, you have a validation of origin. The, the source validation has to do that the repositories of the information are public. They are in the, in the regional registries, for instance, in LACNIC and the other four registries. And when you want to validate, what you do is you install a server, a validator, you bring the information, you validate it cryptographically, and 
with that you can feed the routers using an RTR protocols. With that information, the routers have a table of the ROAs against which they can check the advertising. So basically what the routers will receive when uh, we receive the information of the caches with a table like this, where we will have the prefix, the length, a new thing that is called the maximum length and the uh, autonomous system of origin. And with this, you can assign a validity status for each uh, BGP. If I receive a prefix for BGP, and when I check the ROA table, I see that it's this prefix and the length uh, is between the specified length and the maximum. And uh, the uh, uh, autonomous system of origin uh, match, then it will be valid. It, it is consistent with the information of the ROA. Now, if I receive this prefix and it's more specific or the autonomous system of origin uh, do not match, it will be invalid. A third status is when there's no ROA for a given prefix. That's what happens when you don't uh, don't implement an RPKI, you don't have defined ROAs, so you they won't be found because you won't be protected by ROAs. So it will be termed as not found. The following part is what Erika will discuss. Now we'll have a four minute break. And after that, I'll answer questions if there are any. And then Erika will follow. Thank you, Macarena. There were some pending questions. Once I finish with the questions, Erika, you can take over. Carlos? Carlos? Are you there? Yes, Guillermo, I'm here. <laughs> I wasn't just... <laughs> Oh. You, you're getting anxious. <laughs> yes, I have the mute button in the screen saver of the Mac and well, anyway, this is a very good question here. Maybe it would be good to answer it in detail. And this has to do with what Chicho said initially. And the question is as follows. What type of organizations will benefit from the private querying connections and which organizations will benefit through IXP connections? Well, basically, I had stated that, well, let me start. From an IXP, ideally, everyone should benefit from this. Those who are connected to the IXP, whether small, big content providers, different stakeholders or access providers. So all this can find some reason why IXP would be of use to them. And in practice, many countries do that. Now, it is also quite true that multilateral connections are a better use to smaller providers or for end user organizations which with one single connection, they can interconnect with many others at the same time. In the case of larger organizations, which have a lot of traffic, traffic with another organization, it might be that they might require private peerings and links between one another in order to carry out the traffic because of the volume they have and it might not be advisable to use the IXP in that case. So that's one of the considerations. Nico, would you like to add anything? Yes, very briefly. To add on to what Guillermo was saying, and if I understand Eduardo's question, in that case, as Guillermo was saying, all organizations will benefit basically from the two types of connections because they supplement one another. Like Guillermo was saying, in general, in general, one connects to an IXP, not to have an access to internet, but to receive the routes from the other IXP members and so locally exchange traffic. Now, for the rest of the internet, you will need to have 
o de tránsito. Entonces, viewing type or trans traffic connection. So this is an equation that each organization considers based on the type of traffic that they can download from the peering and transit links and take these to a traffic exchange point. Normally, like Guillermo was saying, you connect to more than one organization through the exchange traffic exchange point, and the cost is lower after a given value than with the common traffic uh, links. So we have to figure out which traffic is better to do to the IXP and which through the peering links. There are more questions. Facundo Townhauser is asking us, which would you say is the error or the risk that is most frequent when carrying out these types of interconnections? This is one of the pending questions that we had prior to the break. Well, I wouldn't know. Could you, would you like to answer? Well, I don't quite understand the question, which is the greatest error or risk? Well, you have to be cautious with the things that Guillermo already explained in his presentation. And also Carlos today mentioned in answering to one question, when you have traffic exchange, you receive routes from members and you don't, you have to be careful not to have a default route aiming at a traffic exchange point. In general, you only publish your routes and those of your clients to the traffic exchange point, but not routes from others because I don't do traffic to a traffic exchange point. These are the things that you have to be cautious about in order to distinguish what a traffic exchange point is and the rest of the traffic. Hugo Rivera Martinez is asking this question on the router by RTR to the validator. Does this increase processing? Or is it as if it were a SNMP query? Well, the RPK has cryptographic validation. That is why this is done externally. And it is in a server that is not on the router. The cryptographic validation is done in the cache of the validator. Now, the RTR traffic is a TCP connection between the router and the server. And through a port, they exchange information. So that will not increase the processing. And then checking the PGP updates against a database, this will not also increase the traffic. So this won't be affected by that. The last question from Maria Alba Puentes. Good afternoon. When I create an AS set, a trans AS set, where do I involve the AS and other clients? And these clients, should they conduct some type of action so that these prefixes are announced by the AS set? Well, this question has an interesting aspect that I didn't mention this time. And it is often to, useful to highlight. There is a difference beyond all the differences that I mentioned between RPKI and IRR, that has to do with the authorization. In RPKI, as I mentioned, the one who authorizes is the owner of the prefixes, the owner of the IP addresses. Now, that is the one that has the capacity. They have a private key, which they can use to sign objects, and that private key has a certificate associated to this prefix. So only the owner of the prefix has that private key and will then be able to sign the ROAs. In that case, in RPKI, it's uh, the owner of uh, the prefixes that can do it. In the case of IRR, the model is different. It's the ISM that defines the object. It's an ASN that defines the route objects, and then it's the ASN that also defines the AS set. In this case, then, the question is, uh, today we saw the AS set, and we saw that it had several members with the different autonomous systems. What did the AS member need to do? Um, in principle, nothing. But the creator of the AS set could request the owner, the member, to define its route object. For instance, if I have 
and I said with uh, the ASMs I give transit to what each of those AS uh, sets uh, are going to ask to define the route object. So when we recurse and uh, look for the prefixes associated to each member, there each member has a, a defined route, uh, but it depends on the provider. Those that the, the one that is going to define whether it's in that AS set or not is the transit provider. The member won't be able to withdraw from there. If a certain provider puts a member in an AS set, that's where it will, it will stay. So the authorization model is completely different. That's one of the most remarkable differences and one of the most subtle differences between uh, RPKI and IRR. There are no more questions. Erika, are you there? Erika? RPKI in practice. We can't hear you, Erika, nor do we see you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, let's then start with the practice of what Guillermo just uh, uh, described, the RPKI. We, this is a hands-on exercise explaining the peering uh, uh, scenario that we are going to mimic a transit scenario and then we we'll see how the ROAs should be created and how the information would pass and we would see our information in our routing table. So, as uh, Guillermo just pointed out, it is important to mention the difference between the ROAs and the route objects in the IRRs. In with the ROAs specifically, we'll see that they will have similar information. A prefix will be associated to an autonomous uh, system number as you have with the router in the IRRs. With this information, then we are going to be able to check the information, uh, the uh, BGP announcement. So something that is completely different between these uh, uh, of the route objects and the ROAs that are the digital uh, certificates used by RPK. Uh, I, because the ROAs are signed cryptographically, this is not what happens in the rest. So these cannot be modified by the uh, third party, but only by the owner of the resource either with IPv4 or IPv6. So we the, we clarify that information. So what are the things that we need to consider to uh, define the ROAs? This was already mentioned this morning and Guillermo just mentioned it again. The persons or the entities have the obligation that have to do this task of creating or defining the, the ROAs are all the organizations or entities that have their own resources, either IPv4 addressing or IPv6 addressing or autonomous systems. So these, this, um, and for Latin, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we can do it through MILACNIC, the MILACNIC portal, that is the tool, the platform that will let us see those objects, the cryptographic signatures that we create. Similarly, we're going to see that, for instance, when the end, maybe we are end users and we don't have our own resources, we um, then the ISP that is uh, providing us uh, the 
addressing uh, pre prefix with which we are making our advertisements will be in charge of uh, issuing the ROAs. So in this case, we do, when if you don't have the, our own addressing, the what we need to do is to ask our internet provider that for this prefix that they are providing us and with that we en route, then they have to create the ROAs. It's also the case of uh, the organizations that have their own IP resources, but they don't have an autonomous system. We already mentioned that with ROAs, we'll indicate a prefix um, um, uh, with the autonomous system. So we will indicate the source of origin of the autonomous system with which we are publishing our IPv4 or IPv6 resources. Now, how? what do I do if I have an IPv4 uh, addressing resource that Lacknick gave me, but I don't have an autonomous system? In that case, the task is to indicate the, in the ISP the, the IP, which is uh, the, uh, when, when they, we have to ask them to create the ROAs and they need to, to know the autonomous system. In this case, it would be the number of the autonomous system of our uh, uh, service provider, our upstream. So bearing this in mind, we will consider then the first steps that we have to validate to define whether we are responsible for creating these objects, the ROAs. What else do we need to take into account when creating the ROAs? Well, we are going to indicate a prefix that is going to be tethered to an autonomous system. And the most important thing is that we have to validate the way we do the advertising. For instance, if we receive a, a prefix slash 19 or slash 22 that were the, the last ones that were being um, provided in uh, uh, with the uh, IPv4 exhaustion, we, we have to know whether we are summarizing or, or breaking it down and whether we break it down, the prefix is broken down to be the, provided to the clients and that is how we are going to indicate the ROAs. We are going to create an object for each prefix that we have broken down. In addition, the most important thing is to create, uh, is, is to respect uh, uh, these policies, to abide by these policies, because if not, we are going to be invalidating our advertising. Remember that um, Guillermo mentioned a valid, an invalid, and a not found status. So when we generate an ROA, and if we don't consider the, that um, breakdown of the prefix, and we only consider the autonomous system, then we are going to um, we need to validate what we are publishing and what we have signatures for and if something will not uh, uh, match. So that, that is where we are going to have an invalid. Erika, can you hear me? I'm Carlos. Could you please speak a little more slowly? So, this is the example of the transit. We'll see that we have five autonomous systems and each autonomous system has an addressing of IPv4, IPv6 that we are publishing. In this transit scenario, where we have the analysis of the autonomous system 65502. This is the one that is going to publish the routes of the autonomous systems that are connected to it to the right, 65510, 65511, and 65509. And so then it will do the transit to the 65501. So we are going to indicate what are the ROAs that need to be created based on this setting. 
So based on this, we're going to start by creating the ROAs that should be uh, created for the autonomous system 501. So for autonomous system 65541, we see that we have uh, an addressing uh, of IPv6 with a slash 48 and uh, for IPv4, we have a slash 24. And when we look at the details, we see that we have three um, ROAs created. So 65501 received a prefix 22 that uh, it broke down for to connect it with the other autonomous system, it, it turning into a slash 24. So, and we are going to see that we're going to have to create two ROA objects for that IPv4 addressing that is 203.0.113.0. Uh, uh, and we are, so this is the addressing with which we are establishing the connection with the other autonomous system. And we will also have to create it and to indicate here when creating the ROAs. And then we'll see that we have an addressing an IPv6, that's a slash 48. And here it's showing that it received the addressing of the internet registry in a slash 48, and it's not being broken down. It, it, this is the way it is published. So we are going to create only one ROA. This, and we are going to do the same with autonomous system 65502. So if you look at the sketch, we have IPv6 and IPv4 addressing uh, allocated. And in this uh, 65502, we see that we receive it an addressing IPv4 of a prefix of a slash 22, and it was broken down. And here we have 65501. So we're going to create a new ROA for that uh, slash 24. That was the the way it was broken down. And the ROA that will be created for the slash 48 in, uh, in uh, IPv6, and this addressing is uh, not being broken down. And so mm, the autonomous uh, systems that are in the other side of uh, 65502, you see that each has uh, uh, an addressing pool assigned both in IPv6 and IPv4. So for the autonomous system, 65509, we are going to create ROA only for this prefix, that's slash 24. And here, as you see, this is the prefix that was received and uh, what is uh, being found uh, for the connection to the autonomous system 65502, that is the transit autonomous system, and we are going to have to create that ROA. In the autonomous system 65502, 10, we have a, a prefix of uh, IPv6, and in 510, we will also have to create one ROA. So, bearing this in mind, what is the information that will be published by each of the autonomous systems, and how will this information be sent in our BGP table? We see that a connection is established with the addressing pool of IPv6 to the autonomous system 65502. And the, we see that the autonomous system is publishing this address that is going to be 65502. Uh, so, so far, we're going to have one autonomous system that is publishing this. The, the prefix then is connecting to autonomous system 501. And from there, you'll see that um, you have the information of the addressing of slash uh, 48 in IPv6 and slash uh, 24 in IPv4. That is the addressing that is being published by autonomous system 5, um, 65, 5, uh, 10 to 9. So the, there you have all the rest. So, the 65510 five, will publish its information and we will now start to show the transit autonomous system, those prefixes with which 
it will wish to establish the connection towards destination. When we see here that it will pass the information from the AS502 to the destination one, which is 501, we see that our ASPAS adds this information of the autonomous system to which it has gone along this route. So we see that in the main information received by the ASPAS or router 502, we see here we have the autonomous system of origin, not the one that generated, that was the, the generated the uh, action. And this one has the 502 information of the ASPAS, bearing in mind that 510 continues being the origin that publishes the route. In the same way for the other autonomous systems, the publication will be made until it reaches destination, which is 65501. And as you see here, we have the autonomous system of origin and the ASPAS adds the information of the autonomous system through which our information goes through the route that we are publishing. And in the same way with ASN65509, this is slash 24, and 502 receives this, it publishes the, this adding its own autonomous system, but we are aware that the autonomous system of origin was 65509. In other words, in this case, it is the autonomous system that has to have the signed ROA. So all this publication of the autonomous system that we have on the right to reach our destination so that the one receiving the information will be the ASN65501. Now let us look at the BGP table. This is a simplified BGP table with all the attributes. They don't have all the attributes. Here we have the information. And we have the network, the network that is publishing this. We have the IPv6 network, the transit autonomous system, and the IPv4 network of the transit network, which is 65502. This shows us the route, and which is a hub. We also see when we speak of RPKI, when we go to implement RPKI in our router, when this is when we activate it and we will see an additional attribute in the BGP table. This is what we call the validity status. This will be the information that we're going to receive in our BGP routing tables and will then show us the status of each of the routes. We have three status, valid, invalid, or not found. So in this way, here we have a validity status. We still don't know it. We haven't started to activate validation. So in the validity status, we, this is the information we have so far. The scenario we saw a while ago shows the information that is being published for each ASM, but we still haven't activated the validity status. We see that each of the autonomous systems and the information that knows the destination, which is 65501, will know all these routes, both in IPv4 and IPv6, that indicated each of the autonomous systems. In addition to that, in the as path, in the path attribute, you're going to see the information of the autonomous system that originated the route and which was the transit information, as is the publication of the prefix 198.51.100 which was published directly in the 65509. So transit was done in 65502. Now remember that in BGP, the behavior of this proto BGP protocol will always be taken into account in, this will take into account the shortest path, the shortest AS path to reach destination. So if we have a lesser amount of a, a path of autonomous system, sorry, 
This is the one it will choose to establish the connection. Let's also remember that we have networks contained in other information packets. The route information, routing information that is most specific is the one that will be provided. So now let us once again go back to this schematic representation of the traffic we have. We see that we're going to now activate validation. And let us see how this would perform when creating the ROAs. Let us see the information we can receive in our routing table. So we're going to say that six autonomous system 65501 will have its validation scheme. It will have its cache server, which will establish the connection with the repositories of each of the internet registries. In this case, these are the ones where the information is hosted of all these ROAs, all the digital certificates that were created. So this server will have the information in real time of all the digital signatures for the, all the routes of IPv4 adapter 6. And through our TR, this information will be provided on the network of the autonomous system 65501. So let us do an exercise focused on a client that is going to come into this scenario, a client that has the number 65509. They have, this client has his own addressing assigned by the internet registry. This is an IPv4 slash 24, and it will publish this in order to reach destination, which is going to be 65501. So in this scenario, which is scenario number three, where we have one client that has its addressing resource assigned, but does not have an autonomous system. The autonomous system that will publish that registry will be the autonomous system 65509. The prov service provider of this client will then the connection. So validation takes place. The client with this topology, we see that all autonomous systems that we had mentioned earlier generated their ROA. They signed the resource, but the client that publishes the route has not signed the resource the IP4 slash 24. So how are we going to see the information in the routing table of the autonomous system 65501 in this scenario? This shows us the following results. The information of the networks, it already knows. Here we see in the last line, the network published by the client, which is 200.7.85.0-24. And we see as we activated our API, we don't see the validity status in the BGP routing table. So this other will be seen as valid because we already have a signature scheme for creating these objects. And the route that was not yet signed will show not found. This is because so far this route is one that it is learning, but in the search of the repository in the cache server, still doesn't find a digital certificate that was created for this route. So we see that the result will show a not found status. Now the client will show the signature of the ROA. For example, here you see the fields that as end users have to complete when you 
create the digital signature at Milat Leak. It is here when you generate the ROAs. You will note that this, these are the fields that you have to include in order not to have a not found status. You will give a name to that digital signature. In this case, the name is Transit ASN 65502. The ASN no, no, uh, number is this one here. It's not this line, but it's the upstream number, which is 65509 in this case. So here we're going to include the origin ASN. In addition to that, this platform asks us to enter the validity of that digital certificate. Normally, the certificates have a validity period that is quite wide, unless we are speaking of resources that are then reassigned to other clients. So in that case, we have to be careful with the validity we enter for that certificate. Furthermore, we have to specify whether this is added or not. And in the validity information, we included that this would be for two years. So the reference I am publishing will not be changed in this period of time. So it's going to be valid for these two years. And then we're going to mention the prefix for which we are creating the digital signature. In this case, it's 200.7.h5.0/24. Then we click on save, and now we have our digital certificate all created. So once we publish it, it is available in the repository of the Internet Registry. So the repositories will have this information. And once you check the validity status, the information will be delivered to all the routers. The routers will say, I know this network. I can see it, or I find a valid certificate for this network for that autonomous system that is generating the route. So the status change, the validity status changes to valid. As a result, we then obtain a table that looks like this. Here we have the information on the prefixes that we receive for this autonomous system. And this cache validator will indicate the maximum number and all the other information. In the case of some of the prefixes we had, as prefix 192.0.2.0/24, we spoke about a maximum prefix length, which was 22. And that had been broken down into the prefixes. So here we have the validation table. Furthermore, we will see that the BGP table knows the autonomous system 65501. See the validity status of these networks that we see through the AS65502. This is the transit autonomous system. So we see in this way that this addressing 200.7.5.0/24, which was the one that the end client had for autonomous system 65509, we're going to see this as valid. So we will now have in a writing scheme all the routing information received in the BGP table. We have information on all the routes that we are checking. And based on these validity status for each of these networks that we receive in the network, we will be able to make decisions as to how to manage these networks that we are receiving. 
we are then going to see a validity scheme where we will be speaking of this as Guillermo saw this before. So when we publish the resource, to which we don't have rights to be published, we would then see this scheme. So an attacker will enter our uh, scenario, an ill-intentioned uh, guy, an ASN 6660, and the, he wants to publish a prefix, but it's the same prefix that the client that was connected to the autonomous system 65509. That is, that this client says, well, this, uh, uh, routing, this addressing is mine, and I want to go to the destination autonomous system, that is 60. 5502. So this is a transit autonomous system. And as I said earlier, when we speak of when we talked about BGP, the BGP always will take the information of the routing map, uh, or the routing table, it will always look for the shortest uh, path. So you see that at the end, the shortest route, when you publish this without having a validation scheme, we wouldn't be able to realize that this is happening because this autonomous system is reaching the um, ASN 65502 directly. It's not going through 65509. So, so in our table, we'll see a shorter route and it will connect with our destination that is ASN 65501. And the information will, will reach destination. It will, the, its information will be published and we won't have the mechanism to know that that is uh, information that is being published uh, by autonomous system that does not have the right to publish this addressing. So looking at this scenario, we see that in a validator cache, we in uh, the uh, network of 65501, we are validating and we'll see that we have a new prefix, the same one that we already knew in, in the past, but now it will show us mass here, it's, the, uh, to, it's a slash 24, but it will show us an autonomous system that is different here, it's 6660. So as we uh, uh, run our validation scheme, we'll see that we'll know the network, but we are going to see uh, something red there. Well, actually we won't see it in red, but we'll be able to see it in the information of the attributes of, uh, the, um, uh, of a table that it's invalid. So that will give us an opportunity to validate this and to check that uh, the ASNs are really those that uh, they claim to be so that uh, in, a, in a normal scheme but if un, unless we do something like this there's no way we can detect and here you see that in the validity status it um, uh, appears that it's invalid so it is there that you will get the information in the bgp table if we want to filter we'll see whether we want to uh, um uh, to stop that route or will we'll decide these routes should not enter our network. And something that we have to consider in the schemes or in the interconnections, as they mentioned it in a question a while ago, that which was the most common error when we are speaking of a transit interconnection system, well, it's that we need to clearly understand what are the routes that we want to publish and the routes that we want to receive. So we're going to be able to validate the, the information that we are receiving and with what tables we're seeing it. So when, as we make the decisions, if it's a, a known a prefix or an autonomous system that, you, that we know, we can see whether it was a problem in the creation of the digital certificate or whether it was a specific problem in the configuration of what they are publishing or whether we are speaking of an attack, a uh, route attack. So we're going to be able to, to establish that in time. So with this, 
we complete the RPKI scenario in practice, and now we're going to start talking about the validators that are generated now. Guillermo, would you like me to go on talking about validators, or would you like to add anything? Now go ahead, go ahead. You have six minutes left, Erika. Right. So, these, uh, this is the software available to install in our catcher server. Remember that if you want to, to build a validation system for our network, we need the this software in our server because in the end, it's a software that will uh, consult uh, the uh, information of the global uh, repositories and bring it locally for uh, uh, for us locally. So one of the uh, the one of the most popular validators is one uh, is the one uh, developed by Ripe NCC. This is one of the first validators available, and it has an excellent graphic interface. The validator will give us information of everything we're validating. A validation table that I showed and that it's very user friendly. We have another validator that is Cloudflare. Cloudflare. This is more um, uh, targeted to CDNs, but something that we were see very clearly is um, the clear separation between the validation and the RTR protocol. No, the, that is the operations uh, that you see between uh, the routers and uh, the uh, RTR uh, protocol. The other, another validator is NL Net Lab uh, Routinator 3000. Uh, there was a lack knock talk about this. This is a very efficient uh, thing and uh, a very striking uh, feature of this software is that it's very efficient in in terms of the use of RAM and the CPU. And finally, we have the Fort Validator that was developed under a project between NIC Mexico and LACNIC. And in this validator, we will see uh, a very efficient validator this also very user friendly it's uh, it's light and it can be executed even in a virtual machine each of these validators have the same usage and the same approach the the, uh, the purpose is to bring the local information of the digital certificates that are known in the repositories of the five rirs so uh, let me talk about the fort validator the, I want you to see this information you in those um, um, uh, addresses in the, uh, you'll see more information about this validator and all the information uh, telling you how you need to install it if you want to use this software to install your validation system locally. And these are the references. And uh, this information will be of great use. And these are tools that will help you know how you publish your resources, whether you are doing it uh, summarized uh, or uh, uh, broken down. So, and how to start creating your ROAs starting from the web, uh, the Milaknik portal, and the information available in the courses of. Uh, of a campus technique on a BGP and RPKI. There's, and there are many tutorials that are very helpful that were developed in the past and they're available in that address. And with this, we finish with the uh, RPKI. I don't know whether there are any questions. Thank you, Aria. That was an excellent presentation with a lot of material. There are indeed two questions. First of all, Hugo Rivera Martinez, who says, if my organization already has ROAs and RPKI, but my 
commercial internet providers do not. Does this create any problems when announcing my prefixes uh, to tier one pro uh, providers through those ISPs? Well, the way I understand the question, they own their resources, they gave their digital certificate to the resources, and the service provider does has not established a validation scheme and is publishing its resources. As these are resources that already have a digital certificate, uh, he won't have any problems because if we reach um, a, a network, you, you speak of a tier three or tier one, well, you they'll see that they are receiving this route, this, this prefix, and they're going to see that it's a valid prefix and the, because they'll go into their catch and they'll see that they see that digital certificate that was generated, but that will be, they'll see that it's the autonomous system of uh, yours and not your provider. So you won't, won't have any problems, even if the ISP has no validation scheme. It's very different if the resource is your own and that you are given that resource by um, by the ISP, and they don't have a, um, they do not have the certificate that there you may have some problems. So he, because they he, they don't have any validation, but at the present there are many networks that work like that. Guillermo Pagliero is asking, could you explain the revalidation process when the certificate date is due? Is it automatic? Does the system let you know ahead of time? Well, we're going to speak of different timings. We're going to establish when we generate the validation in a, of resources, we will indicate our Apache server as uh, a connection to the global repositories. And this depends a lot on how we see the information in our network. But if specifically we are speaking of addressing or this ROA that is due, we need to take it into account when we see it. Because if we were going to validate one of these, for instance, in this ROA announcement, this is a tool of LACNIC Labs, and there you see all these prefixes and their status. They're going to show if they are valid, invalid, or not found. But so that's what we need to do at a personal level. And we are going to, they won't announce that uh, the certificate is due or not, but it will appear as invalid and we'll see it only if we go and check it. And the last one, a very brief answer. We have a question by Nicolas Acosta who asks, good afternoon. Does BGP automatically prioritize the status of validation of a route vis-a-vis uh, -vis the attribute of AS path? Well, speaking of BGP, BGP as such will do nothing and but that action will have to configure it indicating what they should do our server what we should do with uh, these uh, routes what the bgp will do is when when they find a shorter route when it will, it, it will take that path but the in the rest they won't make any other decisions before Nico, giving the floor to Nico. I would like to add something. Like Nico says, can I add, could I add something? Now, what I would like to do is to show some tools that we have available. Let me look these up. Let's see the presentation. If you wish, I can start in the meantime, Guillermo. Yeah, so, so in 
distintas estas All épocas. Right. This is very brief. It's just to show you some other tools and best practice practices. One of these tools, you just speak about DB peering. This is DB is a database with information to establish peering. There you have if contact information and peering sites. This is important so that you register. This is what other organizations use to do peering with ourselves and with you. So if we should establish a peering with another autonomous system, it's likely that they go and find this information at peeringdb.com. So you have this link there. It's very simple to use. This is one of the databases that look at all the CDNs. So it's good to take a look. Then there's another database that is quite different in terms of its use, but it's a public information source regarding the IXPs. This is IXPDB. This collects data directly from the IXP, so you can find a lot of information on the IXPs in different parts of the world. You have information on the IXPs, for example, LACAIX. This is the organization that has the IXPs from the region. And then in other regions, you also have these. And you can have data such as legacy traffic. And then the connected autonomous system. And even things that have to do with network peering hardware, the switches and the hardware that is used by the IXPs. Then they have an API that allows you to consult this to program. Well, Manners, you already heard about Manners. Manners is a mutually agreed, it's a mutually agreed norms for routing security. This has to do with filtering anti spoofing coordination and global validation. It has programs for network operators for IXPs and for CDNs. That is the link of Manners. Regarding tools, I wanted to mention the BGP alert. Uh, we was, spoke about how to do monitoring in BGP and RPKI. So one of the things that we have to do is a way of doing monitoring. So BGP alert was defined by Massimo Candela. He made a presentation yesterday. This is a tool designed by NTT but to monitor its own prefixes, it is open source. It works in real time using real time information. It allows you to detect things, for example, if a prefix loses visibility or is hijacked, if RAS announces invalid prefixes that are not covered by ROA. So it has a lot of options for sending alerts for emails by Slack and dashboard. In the case of Slack, you can receive information such as this, the prefix, et cetera, et cetera, has been withdrawn. It is no longer visible from four peers, or for example, a new prefix is announced by AS4. So these are the things that it can announce, and it's very useful when implementing RPKI. So you will see which are the valid or invalid prefixes or are not uh, detected. Then the Fort project is a tool we developed. This is a monitoring course. It basically shows information that is different from the BGP alert. This is information that is more to verify the status of the implementation in the region and in the world. So it has information, BGP information, information on the IRRs, both for the registries and the NROs. And then, for example, coverage by ROA, validity of the BGP updates, it is classified by country. So this is the link. It is very user-friendly and very useful. 
And then we have info redes. This is a tool we developed recently and provides information on the number of resources of IPv4, IPv6, or ASN. It uses Right Start, a tool developed by Right. This is like an adaptation of that to the languages and usage of the region. It has a look and feel of LACNI. And it also provides routing information, connectivity information, RPI, DNS, and other useful information for network operators. This is a link down here. And this, uh, things, for example, information you can obtain. You have the ASR link. Or here you have the number of prefixes. This is very useful. You put an autonomous system and you see how this has evolved over time, the number of prefixes that it announces. So I strongly recommend this so that you can look at it into in detail. So I will stop here and give the floor to Nico so he can make a very new presentation he has to share with us. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you for your introduction. Now, before starting with the presentation, let me tell you what we will be covering. The idea is to make a presentation. I will try to speak fast and the time at the end for questions and also comments on GP. So if you have any questions as I go along, please write them in the Q&A slot or also any comments that you might have. And at the end, we'll have time for questions. And at about 16.55 Montevideo time, it's 16.15 now, more or less. At 16.55, we're going to have a Kahoot with prizes, the same prizes, prices that we had in other Kahoots. So this is an invitation for you to stay on right through to the end. So let's start. I'm trying, going to try to share the screen. There. Chicho, can you see it well? Yes, yes, perfectly well. So, in this first presentation, there is a, a discussion that we have a year after year with Guillermo when we plan the tutorial. Every year, Guillermo asks me, but he doesn't ask me, he says, again, the same presentation. And I say, yes, because the presentation is actually a guide because BGP hasn't changed much, but there's new experience. There are always new things uh, that uh, we can uh, command and new people that are seeing it for the first time. So this presentation is just a guide. And if you attended the last 10 events of LACNIC, you may have seen at least part of it. So let's talk a bit of BGP, uh, mostly uh, concerning uh, peering and some things that we need to take into account when using BGP to establish the peering connections, the peering sessions. The first thing that we'll see is, well, many of you may know this, this is a reference, you'll see that by each comment, by each suggestion, you have a, an emoji, and there you have the meaning. Oh, that would be the most basic. And finally, at the end, the uh, emoji is very uh, illustrative. It says what we shouldn't do, by no means. As to BGP, BGP multi-hop 
one of the recommendations is when I'm peering, there cannot be more hops than necessary. That's a, a possibility that we have when configuring the BGP, that in many cases, we don't pay much attention. But it's an additional action for the sake of security when you establish a BGP session to say whether my peer BGP is uh, two hops I put two hops and not more. So somehow I'm collaborating and I'm preventing somebody to establish a BGP session uh, with more hops um, and more hops. And uh, uh, the other way around, if I'm establishing a BGP and I know that uh, I have a number of hops at least, I have to configure that number of hops so that the BGP session may get established. And then using MD5 to authenticate the peer and to securize the, uh, the uh, BGP message and to use access list to um, permit uh, updates uh, only of the peers and the side of the interface, my side of the peer, my router, my border router that I use for the BGP session, I configure the list of acts, the access list only to allow the BGP updates of the peers and not from other um, IP origins. And there are other techniques that are used. Some people even use in some cases where there's direct uh, interconnection, some use uh, private addressing or they don't publish the addresses that they use for the peer. So there are other methods that are used in other cases that are also valid uh, to use in BGP peering sessions. Mechanisms to generate the prefixes. And here I want to dwell on this uh, because this is interesting and it's something that we need to consider. When you generate the prefixes whenever possible. We need to avoid redistributions from the IGP precisely to uh, avoid disseminating to other networks our internal problems and not to distribute, redistribute the protocol of the external router to the internal router. The redistributions, of course, a possibility for redistributing exists, but in my humble opinion, we should use them only when we absolutely need them. Possibility of a centralized management of publications. Well, we when we have a few peerings or few BGP sessions, it, this is not an issue, but as the peerings um, uh, increase if the BGP sessions start uh, escalating, then it's increasingly interesting to have uh, some more or less automated mechanism, more or less uh, makeshift. Uh, there are commercial systems to do this in the market, but you can implement your own in-house systems, even with uh, open source uh, software precisely for that, to uh, have a more centralized or more automated uh, publications, BGP publications, and to quit um, publishing some prefixes for some peering sessions, to change the, B, uh, the peering BGP session for the one that I'm publishing uh, a certain number of prefixes, internal management of communities, well, this comes hand in hand with, on the one hand, uh, thinking of using different internal communities to manage the publications using communities, not internally only, but as prearranged, or some of them are standardized to give the, the possibility to my appearing counterpart to adopt a number of actions, for instance, uh, generating remote black holes. So we need to be careful not to propagate uh, 
internal use uh, um, uh, um, messages to the other counterpart of appearing. And then see how we generate the publications when uh, warning, when, when publishing our prefixes to the our appearing counterpart. Basically, the most common case, the most commonly used to generate the publications is in our router, there I drew a path. BR4 would be our border router that has a peering session. No, BR1. BR4, BR1, BR2, and BR3 are our backbone, and BR1 is a border router that has a peering session with the router of some other autonomous system. What regularly, uh, what is used to generate the BGP publications is once I configure the BGP session between my border router, BR1 in this case, and the, the border router of the counterpart, is I enter a, a, a static route to match the prefix that I want to publish, and I put, I publish that prefix, in the BGP part of the configuration, and then I generate a static route to null. Because you know that BGP will only publish the route if it is present in its routing table. So the, if you put it at null, that means that the prefix um, will be present there, and therefore the publication gets uh, completed, the BGP publication. What problems may, can this pose? What happens if the interconnection between that border router and the backbone router get disconnected? If there's a connectivity problem in my network and it, then my border uh, router gets uh, interrupted. As I have a publication with a border uh, a router with a null zero route, the fact that I lose connectivity and I, I left I say isolated, still I publish the route to the peer. So if I don't have a management system, uh, an off-band uh, management system, it's more complicated still because I wouldn't have be able to access my border router, nor could I download my BGP. Uh, the, the counterpart would continue to send me the traffic through that link, but that traffic would be discarded by my border router because it's as isolated. So, as a mechanism, Nico, just a comment about that. The example you gave, yes, that one. BR1 could be, for instance, if you are in an IXP and you have a router in the IXP and if you were announcing the route, this is, it could be a, a rather common example in a, a, in a data center, for instance, you could have a, a router and the rest of your network is somewhere else and you're generating the route here. And if that gets disconnected, then, uh, yeah, yes, in many cases, uh, what you do is you hire some carrier uh, and you install your, router there and you connect it uh, to the um, uh, IXP or the router, uh, it depends on the model, but we don't have a huge structure for traffic exchange. So if you have only one router and there is a problem in that link that could be a metro network between my machine or my data center and the IXP or the data center where the IXP is located. That could be quite a, a common situation. The, the router would remain isolated. So this other mechanism that I wanted to show you is a way to somehow improve the response when that situation occurs. 
alguna contra, no, no todos no todo. When we look at it, I will tell you some of the cons. Of course, not everything is uh, positive. Now, the next modality that we show here is the same. I have the BGP peering session between my border router and the counterpart router, between VR1 and the counterpart router. But now, instead of generating and instead of having the static route in zero in VR1 in my border router, I include it in another router of my network that has or maintains a BGP protocol activated and opens BGP to my border router. So in this example, my router BBR4, the core is four. And, and I would put the route in zero in the core router BBR4. In this example, I propose putting the routes in the two BBR4 and BBR2, assuming that the entire core and the borders all speak BGP with one another. So if I put the route in zero, the border route, Router BR1 will also be present in its routing table in terms of the prefix because it will transmit this, it will send it to the BGP protocol from the core router to the border router. So the BGP will be published because, as we said, it is present in the routing table, not because it has a static route in the there, but because the prefix is being passed by the core router. Now, if there is an interruption in the connection between as in the previous case between the border router and the core, what happens in this case, if there's an interruption, because the core router can no longer alert this, then the border router stops being present in the routing table for the prefix, therefore, the prefix, the BGP publication will no longer have an effect and then is the block is automatically not published without the need to take any necessary action on our side. So like Guillermo was saying, the core writer is in the data center. The border router is a router I use for peering purposes and I installed in the data center. What are the disadvantages? There could be some disadvantages. The greatest disadvantage I can think of is the following. What would happen with the traffic? For example, an attack or maybe not an attack, just traffic addressed at that prefix, but without a specific assignment in my network. For example, IP addresses that are free for that prefix or someone that is doing an attack by sending a lot of traffic to that prefix in order to saturate that link. In, in the previous case, we had that route at zero in the border router, then the traffic will be absorbed and discarded. That useless traffic will be discarded. I put the route in a zero. So the traffic will enter, will travel to my backbone and then discard it there in the backbone, in the router backbone. So. In the case of such adver in an in a adverse condition such as that, it could be identified as a con because it could saturate my core router. But if this is an attack and if it is large enough in order to saturate the peering link, it will also not be so important whether it saturates the link with a core or not. Of course, I have to have a link with a core at least with an equal bandwidth as with a peering link. But anyway, this shouldn't represent a very serious problem. But it's good to know and good to comment it. And the third and final example, this is another variant, namely introducing these two routers that are included here. It could be one or two. The R's, R, G, R, one. These routers are publication generation 
routers. These routers have a similar role like the ones Vijayma mentioned earlier today, similar to the function of the routers for peering in the traffic exchange points. So these routers here could be software routers. And these were not routers that have been considered for receiving traffic, but these have been for the purpose of generating BGP publications. In this variant, I would include the zero root, I wouldn't put in the border or in the background. I would put these in the router seat. These would be speaking the BGP protocol. So when I wish to publish a route to my peer, I generate the publication. I put the network in the BGP instance of the BR1 and the route in zero, I place in the RGRs here, the publication generating routers. If I place it there, then this route due to internal routing, it will then be transmitted to the border router. The border router will then be present in the routing table for that prefix and will publish it through BGP. Once again, if there is a, an interruption between the border router link and the core router, then the border router uses no longer has a presence of that prefix and does not publish it. And the other advantage of having the RGRs that imagine the same scenario, but many border routers with many traffic exchange points or with just one. The border routers have many peering sessions. So imagine if I wish to manage that and using the first method we saw, I would have for each of the border routers to configure all the BGP sessions, which I have to do them anyways, and then enter all the prefixes that I wish to publish in each of these border routers. So with this mechanism now, with the RGR devices for centralized publications, we, I generate the BGP sessions in all the border routers, but all the prefixes are managed centrally in the publication generators. So simply, if I wish to download a route, I put the, then all the freeing sessions will no longer publish that route. If I wish to add a new route, which is already added in the relevant networks of the BGP sessions that wish to publish it, I add the route in the publication generation and that route is then published throughout all the links. So this mechanism provides an additional option to that. This system also allows to easily centralize the publication mechanism of BGP. And then once I have this, I can use these publication generators so that they can generate centralized information. For example, for managing the black holes uh, centrally. And also for other types of things. This can be supplemented with some kind. For example, if you don't wish to have the problem, well, in this situation, I mean, the same scenario of an attack where the traffic instead of reaching the border reaches a backbone in the previous example now the traffic would go through the entire backbone and reach the generators which we said was not desirable for them to receive traffic now in this route and using some kind of technique or also combining it with protocol uh, some type of protocol i could also even define that the generator of the publications and using a given community would then indicate the border router, the BR1, for example, highlighting the prefix of the community would then indicate that the border router could can have something configured that when receiving that prefix from the community, then positions itself as a route for that prefix, but in a dynamic way. 
so that if I were to receive an attack or a flow addressed an IP address for that prefix that is not using my network, then that traffic would be discarded at the border before going through the entire network. And of course, there are many more combinations of things and ideas that we could add to this in order to make it far more interesting. Nico, you said in passing that these, these generators, if you had border routers in different IXPs, or if you would wish to publish routes in some IX in IC and others in others, or different tiering, something that you can also use is that the generating routers could label communities and then based on those communities, you can publish this. Well, yes, in the same way as I can mark them all as a community and say that the border routers should zero everything they reach, that reaches them. If, what I can also do, as you said, Guillermo, is to use community. And let us assume we have 10 border routers, each with a lot of peering sessions. And I wish to manage all these in a centralized way from the centralized generators. So what I can do is to apply exactly the same configuration to all the BGP sessions. In other words, pre-configure all the blocks in all the BGP sessions. And so generate groups of blocks associated to communities. So afterwards, if because all the networks are there, are just adding or removing the roots and the RGRs, and then each of these marking them with some kind of community, I can determine through which link using the prefix and can add or remove prefixes well to need to change the configuration of the border routers. I can figure the border routers once and they remain like that, and then the entire operation is done through the centralized generators. Yes, that would be great. And it is something that you can do perfectly well using this type of architecture. More on BGP in general, remember to control the published prefixes. Be careful and control the publish prefixes. Do not publish prefixes that are not yours. This is not to become traffic, sometimes because of errors in configuration. For example, I'm configuring the border router in the peering session. I remove a filter in order to set it up once again, and I then forget that the GP by default as a certain type of behavior and starts to publishing everything that I have. And that's why I end up publishing all the prefixes which I don't wish to do, but also the prefixes of my chance. And it wasn't the idea to publish these to that peering link and things of that size. So we have to be cautious whenever we do some kind of modification to a list to access anything or that allows to publish certain things. So in that case, the idea is to replace this with a, uh, I prepare a new list and then I just replace that with the new list and to minimize the possibility of making a mistake. Of course, we all made these mistakes in operations. Then to control the received prefixes to control what I received, to use RPKI, use IRRs, and combine all that. And be careful, particular caution with the default route. Normally, these are not sites that we want to publish the default routes because I just want to send what I really know is on the other side. I want to send the traffic there that is addressed to the peers with which I am related and not just anything else. Nor will I receive a route by default through those links. Filtering of uh, AS, uh, the, uh, I don't have to 
uh, permit uh, the traffic of uh, the autonomous systems, I can use uh, IRR to validate those lists and uh, RPKI to know that the prefixes that claim uh, to come from a certain uh, uh, origin are originated by an autonomous system to avoid accidental hi or intentional hijacks. Not publish uh, private AES if I if I use them, filter or eliminate the AES path, uh, path there is a command that uh, eliminates all the private uh, autonomous systems. Do not publish private networks. This I think this is, it sounds trivial or uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, very obvious, but sometimes we may forget filtering and prevent private networks from uh, being uh, leaking even um, less than slash 24 in uh, peering IPv4 or the equivalent in IPv6. When we do uh, peering with caches to inform prefixes, it is healthy to configure an access list uh, of the uh, type uh, uh, null in. And in the case of the cache, a usual model used by contents uh, um, providers is to request us to establish a peering connection with the cache uh, servers to inform the SD, the, the N, the, which are our blocks so that they can see the traffic that is directed to our network and they can provide a traffic from the local uh, cache service and not from a remote site. In those cases, if I use the BGP uh, peer, the peering session with my cache to inform the cache about the fixes, the, 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 there's no need for it to accept anything coming from the cache. So include, remember to include a rule that says do not accept any information coming from the cache so that an error uh, in the configuration of the cache may pro propagate uh, to mine. Do not uh, propagate um, com internal use communities. For instance, put uh, maximum prefix alarms. You have to set the BGP in a way that it will send you a message uh, um, and you say what will tr trigger that uh, alarm. So, and the router will send me uh, an, uh, an, uh, a notice saying if when I a certain peer has more a number of prefix that's exceedingly high. So for instance, if, they, if I have to publish 150 uh, prefixes, I put 200 as a limited. If I receive 200, then that will trigger an alarm. And that may potentially be telling me that my counterpart is having some problems or made a mistake and they're publishing more than necessary. So there I go and check what's happening. And I could even choose to uh, disable the BGP session to prevent a tsunami of traffic from going that way. This was this is a quick example of uh, the operation of a local catch. Um, sometimes the operators, the catchy operators, what they do is request us to raise a BGP session against the catch uh, server, the local catch servers to inform what our prefixes are. How does this work? In, in this case, this is a typical case, the catch provider, what it does is receives those prefixes from my network that I publish through BGP, and it informs it to a DNS server, and the DNS server of the contents of, uh, is a customized uh, server. So when a client of one of my customers uh, sends uh, the uh, question to the uh, DNS server so that they will give you uh, the server where they have to go and look for the contents, that DNS uh, server customized by the content provider will not always send the same IP address associated to the name, but depending on my IP address, 
it will send back the IP address of the cacher servers that I have locally. So my clients can go to the local cache and the autonomous system may go to their own local cache. This is the reason why many content providers that use CDNs or SDNs or caches ask us to establish a BGP session against their cache servers. I think this is the last slide. It is. We're going to mention a few things very quickly. Consider the use of a remote triggered black hole. Remember that this mechanism to prevent attacks, especially denial of service attacks that may saturate my links and prevent it from reaching my border link and uh, reach my network. And the idea is to put a null zero route for the prefix that is being attacked in the count my counterpart peering uh, so that they will uh, discard that traffic and prevent it from reaching me. Likewise, we can use local black hole techniques not uh, break it down more, uh, disaggregate more than necessary. Guillermo explained it at the beginning, and this is something that is mentioned frequently in routing sessions. And there, there's always a balance, or, or you, it's a compromise. If you have more than one appearing session against a counterpart, of an IXP, how do I distribute the traffic through those several links? So if I have a prefix slash 22, I get two peering links. I can break it down into four slash 24s, and I publish two prefixes in through one link, two other through another. There I'm breaking, I'm uh, de-aggregating. Instead of publishing one single slash 22 uh, blocks, then I divide it into uh, four slash 24. So I'm publishing four blocks instead of one. Remember that there are me mechanisms to minimize that from getting propagated um, beyond my peering counterpart by using uh, the no expert community. I could publish my counterpart the four slash 24 blocks, but those slash 24, I publish it through the no expert community. So my counterpart won't propagate that to the rest of the autonomous systems or whom they are appearing with. The, those four will only live in the network of my counterpart. And in addition, I publish through any link the slash 22 prefix with no, uh, uh, without the no expert community. So the traffic that comes to that prefix, when it reaches my counterpart, notice that the rest will only see the slash 22 when the traffic comes to my counterpart. In, in my counterpart network, there are four slash 24s and there the traffic will be divided and it will come to me through the two links. So I can do that traffic engineering, but I won't prop, it won't uh, uh, send it any further. Using communities agreed upon among peerings, coordination. So that was the idea of today's presentation. Didn't I surprise you, Guillermo, very quick. I, I have never been, uh, I have never spoken as fast because it, this is not a presentation that needs uh, any ending. Well, it's, well, in this one, you could uh, have allowed me to speak. Yes, I could have. But we, we have a, do we have a Kahoot? Well, I have many, many questions, and I'd like at least to ask a couple. Guillermo, I think that we have until uh, 17, uh, 10? No, until 17. So let's see the questions uh, very quickly. The questions are all in Spanish, so I won't repeat that. Marcelo Sosa asked, hello, Nico. 
uh, additionally, with our ours, uh, could you use uh, BGP confederations? Wouldn't this reduce the number of public BGP publications? Yes, I didn't want to enter into details, and the answer is yes. And you can add also route deflectors or reflectors if you have many appearing uh, um, as the IXPs put uh, only to exchange routes, and it's similar to uh, route reflector. And the answer is yes, you can do it. Carlos Altamirano has two questions. One of them is, it would be a good choice to announce through OSPF a BR1, the network that wants to announce a peer. Well, you could do it because it would generate the presence in the route table. But my suggestion is there, it's better to use BGP because with BGP, you have all the advantage. The centralized, if you use, and OSPF, it's things are going to get complicated. So it's better to separate the internal routing protocol or the uh, from the other BGP and to use uh, eBGP for their publications and to leave the OSPF uh, for the internal things. Carlos Altamirano again. Is there a Bogum network list maintained by, no, there is a list, uh, a Bogum network list by, uh, CYMRU, have you used it? Yes, yes, Guillermo removed the slide. I wanted to mention it, but if you use filters, you need to update it. It's not just installing it and forgetting about it. You have to update it. The, the fun thing about the basic list of Bogans now, there are only three routes. There's an extended Bogan network that's a bit longer. Facundo Townhouse, uh, default routes, using uh, learned by BGP or using static uh, routes with, with tracking. Just for the fun of uh, the quarrel, none of the two. That is my personal taste, and but it's controversial. I do not recommend using a default route because I want to control my default route and if the other one makes a mistake and allows me to publish it, then well, this is not for appearing, this is for transit, but I prefer to generate my own default list and one way is through tracking and the other is to generate the default route in the centralized router that you mentioned. Very good. And the very last, Guillermo Pagliero, in IPv6, do they recommend to publish the slash 48 or summarize in less specific networks? That's a good question. I could have asked it. Well, in IPv6, uh, well, the idea is to summarize. If the recommendation is to break down, it would be the other. You have to do it the least possible. Now, if you have a slash 32 assigned by IPv6 and you already have enough traffic volume that if you publish that slash 32 for a, a link and that gets saturated the only way out is to divide it into smaller ones so so break it down the least possible and if you do try to for is, for instance use the no expert community to publish the more specific blocks and to publish the other blocks with no community so that those blocks will propagate and the other may live only in your peers. Very good. Emmanuel Serrano and IPv6 a slash 48. Can it be published in uh, three different links? Uh, well, that uh, that is a wonderful question. Um, can, can you publish in three different links with the same ISP? What happens with the routing of prefixes longer than a slash 48? Well, in IPv6, you can use, you can use uh, three different uh, links with the same ISP. You can do it, but, the, but it may cause trouble. If you have a lot of traffic that may saturate a link and then in the network of your counterpart of your peer, you don't know what's happening and you can't control it. So maybe your peer absorbs the entire traffic and it ends up coming to your, uh, all the traffic comes to your network because of one of those links. Anything can happen there again. The suggestion, 
Could you elaborate a bit on that? Because I think that Manuel's question is excellent. It's, uh, there are two things. If what you mentioned there is that you have three links with your amps, you may agree with your upstream uh, sharing of a glass of beer that you have to break down that slash 48 in a slash 50. Can serve through local traffic engineering. And the other is that you agree to use community. Yes, the other thing, do they have the same router if the three links, regardless of your provider having in three different routers, if you have them in the same router and you have to agree on this with your provider for the outgoing and incoming traffic, so each one can configure it for their outbound traffic. You can configure what we call BGP multipath that enables BGP to install more than one route in the routing table. So basically, it truncates the 270,000 things that BGP does to try and keep just one path. It cuts it at a given point, and it allows you to maintain more than one route for the same prefix. And there, although you publish the same slash 48, through more than one link with the same ISP, then the traffic more or less could be balanced, more or less, because normally it's done based on flow. Nico, this reminds me of the satellite links, uh, multipath. And this is interesting because we haven't, this is done picking up sessions for the loop bus, and this has to be supplemented with three statics or n number of statics in order to distribute the traffic and let the next hub reach or tell that the next hub is not directly connected, strictly speaking. Yes, we had radio links and so on. Yes, exactly. Yes, but yes, that is possible. And if, and otherwise, you can add those balancing mechanisms during multipath. All right, great. Well, this was an excellent tutorial lots and lots of material lots of questions thanks to all of you who joined us unfortunately we run out of time now